Well, good afternoon and welcome to today's FS Club webinar. I am absolutely thrilled to have with us uh, Professor Sir David Oman, uh, GCB. Uh, David is visiting professor in the Department of War Studies at King's College London, uh, but many of you will know him uh, from his roles in, in, in the years past uh, at GCHQ. And we'll come on to some of that background, which you've also received in the two emails that you got uh, in booking this event. So I won't bore you with that. Um, you'll know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors at Xi'an, and it really is a privilege to be able to introduce so many of these webinars, which I can only do so thanks to uh, the tolerance, uh, generosity, and wide-ranging interests of our many sponsors, whom you can see before you. Uh, and what is great about uh, today's webinar is that it draws together all the strands that all of us are most concerned about. What do we do in a crisis? Uh, and as David's going to point out, it's not necessarily what you do in a crisis, it's what you do before the crisis uh, that really matters today. Uh, David will be talking uh, about uh, a new book that's coming out. He also has many other books uh, in the past, which we've covered. Uh, but I must say the, the book that is coming out was my skiing reading the week before last in Austria, as I got a draft copy. And it is a very, very good, crackingly good read, uh, full of sensible and straightforward advice. Now, uh, for those of you uh, familiar with FS Club, you'll know the format here. My job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible and hand you over to our expert. Uh, David will be speaking for approximately 20 minutes. Uh, there are some slides, but listen attentively. David isn't really relying on the slides. Uh, he's very much relying on, uh, on some very detailed and interesting notes about uh, not just the book, but the, the wider issues that we face here. We'll then move into questions and answers. And uh, please use the GoTo webinar Q and A facility. David and I are here with you. Uh, we're not uh, on Signal, WhatsApp, watching our emails, or looking at Twitter or anything else. Uh, so fire questions, comments, observations, thoughts into the Q and A facility here on GoTo webinar, and I will feed them in uh, to the discussion session with David. Um, also, David will be receiving all of your comments, questions, and observations, and your email attached. So if you want to get hold of him or point something out to him that you think he might be interested in, feel free to just go ahead and put it in there. Uh, and a final point of housekeeping, yes, this is being recorded, and the recording will go up in approximately two working days, so realistically sometime late afternoon on Friday, which will make it excellent viewing now that the rugby is sadly over, um, so you can watch it on Saturday with the popcorn. Um, I'll leave it at that in terms of housekeeping, but uh, just before we started, David and I thought uh, with the team, it might be a little bit of fun just to have a poll, get a bit of a flavor of how you, the audience, are, uh, are feeling. And there is, in fact, be careful, a second poll uh, coming later in this session. But uh, if you wouldn't mind, fingers on buzzers, please, to which one of the following potential slow burn crises would you most want the government to give priority? Growing in income inequality in the UK, the long-term state of the NHS, a US-China Cold War, readiness for the next serious pa pandemic, extreme weather events affecting the UK. While you're answering, uh, we, were, we were going to leave this as an open question, but I thought people would talk about obesity or particularly slow burn, uh, maybe HS2 coming perhaps in 2040. Who knows? Anyway, David, a very quick audience, uh, virtually everyone's voted, so we're just going to present those results back. And it, wow, this is astonishing, given the number of people that are online. 17, 17, 17 uh, for three of them. Uh, the pand next pandemic, nobody seems to care about any longer. Um, but nearly half the audience are uh, concerned about the slow burn US-China Cold War. So I have a small suspicion uh, what some of the chat room questions might be. And it's truly astonishing, the three 17s there. Anyway, David, with no further ado, the floor is very much yours. That's a fascinating result. Well, thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for this opportunity. What I want to talk about and discuss with you all is the nature of modern crises and how we can best prepare ourselves, and I should say our loved ones and our organizations, working upstream of the crises we're bound to encounter in the decades ahead. Um, as Michael mentioned, uh, my next book, How to Survive a Crisis, Lessons in Resilience and Avoiding Disaster, Penguin are publishing on the 1st of June. And there's much more in the book uh, than I can cover uh, this afternoon. But I want to highlight some of the main things that experience has taught me. Um, there's obviously no shortage of raw material for writing about modern crises, 
we've got a war in Europe, we've got an energy crisis, we've got a coronavirus pandemic continuing, and now we've got bird flu. We've just had a catastrophic earthquake, floods, drought, famine, environmental disasters, and the old, the old threats, terrorist atrocities, massive cyber attacks, international disputes, and I'd probably throw in uh, bank failures, given the last uh, week or so. All of these can have consequences close to home. And for many of us, for many families, the impact of what you would think of as a global crisis actually becomes profoundly personal. And we'll see this with job losses from Credit Suisse, no doubt, in due course. I think there'd probably be a consensus that threats, that is, that have malign human agency behind them, are, uh, are increasing, especially in cyberspace. But I, in the same breath, I want to highlight the problems that the hazards, natural hazards, from the impersonal forces of nature, the occasional large-scale accidents, the way that those will test us as well. And one of the problems we've got in the modern age is that whatever the challenge is, the increasing complexity and fragility of society, of our supply chains, which have recently been tested, uh, it, we are more vulnerable. But my main argument is not one of pessimism, it is that the worst effects can be mitigated if, but only if, we work upstream, we have careful preparation and investment. And I do believe that we can build resilience at a personal level, toughening ourselves up, at an organizational level, and sometimes, sadly, we have to do it at a national level, so we can absorb the shocks, learn the lessons, and bounce back stronger. Now, there will be nobody, I would bet, on this call who has not experienced a crisis of some sort. It may have been in the family, it may have been at work, a hostile takeover, a business calamity that caused a loss of investor confidence, or indeed the result of some external catastrophe that a while, for some time, turns our world upside down. And we know, instinctively, we're in crisis, when challenging events pile on faster than we can respond to. The normal levers of control don't seem to be connected to the brakes. The situation often threatens to spiral out of control. Having experienced many crisis situations affecting government during my career, I use the rubber levers test. So you have the metaphorical control panel, warning lights are flashing, bells are ringing, but the levers and the switches and the buttons don't appear to have the effect that those in charge have been led to expect. At that point, every lever that's pulled seems to be disconnected from reality on the ground, and new problems are then created. The situation, as I say, threatens to spiral out of control. Now, we should aim off for the fondness of media headline writers for the word crisis. Not every bump in the rutted political road is actually a national crisis. And as we've just seen with the failure of SVB, a crisis may not last long if you've got underlying resilience in the system and some prompt decisive action gets taken. When you look back on these sort of events, you can see what I describe as a typical arc of crisis. It starts with an unexpected and abrupt awakening to something going seriously wrong. And that's followed by confusion, uh, uncertainty, and then eventually situational awareness is established. You begin to realize what is actually happening on the ground. And then eventually with luck, previously rehearsed procedures kick in and you begin to get the situation under control. One of the problems, of course, is that the arc of crisis doesn't end at that point. The final stages tend to drag on. You've got high level commissions of investigation. You may have formal inquests being set up. Almost certainly you'll have civil court cases being brought by families of the victims. 
often alleging negligence by management. And then in many cases, there's completion of the cleanup and the repair of damaged facilities or acquiring fresh IT or whatever it might be. And the repair of personal and brand reputations, and that can take years. And what you then get to is a new normal. That's what I call the typical arc of crisis. I think it's important to think of a crisis, as I do, being poised between an emergency and a disaster. If you've spotted the potential for trouble, you've invested upstream and sensible preparations, including building up resilience, then yes, you may have a short period of crisis, but it can be folded back into states of emergency for which you have plans, you have capability, you have emergency services. Situation will still be tough, but you will have re reasserted control. But if you haven't anticipated the possibility, or I may add too often, there were warning signs, but you ignored them, you were looking but not seeing the looming problem, then when crisis does break, it will be beyond you and the situation will worsen and it will tip the other way into disaster. So what makes a crisis more than a big emergency is the realization that at least for a short term, short time, the, the, the pace, the scale of events are threatening to overwhelm even planned responses. The course of normal life can't continue. We saw this during COVID-19 life for many will never be the same again and of course we're always at risk of crises not arriving singly but concurrently uh, testing in particular the insurance market and you can see that in such complex circumstances what responses we adopt like closing schools in a pandemic may well end up prolonging the crisis after the 9-11 terrorist attacks in Washington and New York, there was a Congressional Commission of Inquiry, as there tends to be after such events, and they warned of what they called the paradox of warning. So you postpone investment in preventative measures on the grounds that there are always more pressing immediate priorities. But then by the time the real threat is identified, it may be already too late to stop it. And the worst crises to manage are those that I term the slow burn crises. And I, we had some of those in the questionnaire that uh, you answered a moment ago. The problem may well have been building up for years. Sometimes these are called rising tide crises because the situation worsens slowly, little by little like the parable of the frogs being slowly boiled, and there's never a right time to act to avoid trouble. Some of these crises in waiting that I put on that, uh, that, that questionnaire, they're already in plain view. They're elephants in the room. Everyone knows they're there, but governments and uh, C-suites often choose to ignore them. They're listening, but they're not hearing. And when you have these slow burn crises festering away for years, those in charge may well have a nagging feeling that at some point something should be done, but the time and the circumstances are never quite right until that awful realization, that awful moment is too late and the crisis has actually arrived. Picking an example out of the air, the long-term erosion of the pay of junior doctors, for example, uh, that's been eroding for years. Pay awards for junior doctors in England from 2008 to 2009 through to the period 21-22 have actually delivered to those junior doctors on whom we depend a pay cut in real terms of over 26%. So allowing that to continue to fester, eventually you run into real trouble as we now see. Illegal immigration is another. Five years ago, only 539 people tried to cross the channel in small boats. The following year, it was 1900. 
last year it was over 45,000. And at that point, number 10 will announce that the Prime Minister intends to grip the crisis. But by that time, the criminal gangs are so well established, so well resourced, their tentacles stretch back into their countries of origin, they're nearly impossible to dislodge. One of the problems here, uh, evidently, is that to admit to the existence of these slow burn crises is to admit that recent policies or current policies and strategy for which the same leaders are responsible is actually failing to deliver the desired results. And deep down, it's usually easier to find reasons to justify delay in the knowledge that should crisis break, at least then you can make the change for a, make the case for necessary change. But it's those slow burn crises that I think are hardest to resolve, precisely because they've been overlooked, ignored, or simply not understood as posing a major risk. And by the time bad luck or some triggering event finally ignites the crisis, the problems are so deep rooted as to be near insoluble. Now, I've seen the damage that failure to deal with long lasting crises can have on the individuals in charge. Reputations are fragile things. It's very easy to lose them in crisis. We will all remember the painful experience that Tony Howard went through as Chief Executive Officer of BP after the huge 2010 Macondo oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And he ended up, of course, losing his job when US politicians, including the president and the hostile media, ripped into him. Uh, we can all, I think, uh, empathize when he made the remark of saying within earshot of the media some weeks into the crisis, there's no one who wants this over more than I do. I would like my life back. But it was a remark not likely to endear him to the Gulf of Mexico residents. And with social media these days, the inevitable repost came from a local fisherman who said, I want my life back too. He's ruined it. So surviving crisis was in many respects simpler in pre-social media days. I have to keep reminding myself that the idea of Facebook only came to Mark Zuckerberg in 2004. Twitter started in 2006 and it was 2007 before the first iPhone was released in the UK. And now we've got 40 billion internet connected devices in the so-called internet of things, creating huge issues if there's a disruption of service or a crisis in the delivery of uh, uh, reliable IT services, uh, internet services. And of course, the moment you have a rumor of trouble, it spreads at the speed of light or just under it. Panic buying is what you get. It's common at the first hint of trouble. And these days, deliberate disinformation is gonna make matters worse. We saw this with COVID-19 anti-vax propaganda. Some of it pushed out by Russia, some of it just generated um, by anti-vaxxers. Now, uh, that kind of remark kind of brings me to cyber attacks. In 2017, the Russian, the GRU, the, uh, the military intelligence wing, launched the NotPetya malware. They were intending to disrupt Ukrainian companies, but the malware escaped. It ended up wiping data and infecting networks around the world. It's been estimated reliably that some $10 billion worth of damage was done to global business. The world's largest logistics company, Maersk, had a near death experience because the malware affected their data backups. Imagine you're a company that has millions of containers with billions of dollars worth of goods in them, but you've lost the data on where the containers are what's in them and where they're going. That, in anybody's book, is a genuine crisis. In the case of Maersk, the story is well known, the gods of IT relented. 
and by luck, the mayor's office in Sierra Leone had suffered a power cut and was offline when the virus spread and therefore had an uncorrupted copy of the operating system that Maersk had built from which company recovery was possible. And that's why I speak of experiencing a crisis as being in an unstable situation. And the situation can flip either way. Good upstream preparation, you'll get support quickly available and with luck, you can uh, revert it to being a manageable emergency or even avoid it altogether. But it's when the crisis can then flip the other way, sliding into disaster with significant loss of uh, finance or environmental uh, uh, damage or even loss of life. Now, some experienced practitioners have argued that the term crisis management, and there may be some people on this call uh, who make a business out of teaching crisis management. Is that term misleading? I rather think it is. You don't often succeed in managing a real crisis. Too often it manages you. And crisis survi survival is really keeping your balance, inching along the high wire to avoid tipping into disaster, whilst you try to reach some solid ground of proven emergency management. The more thorough the preparation, the less likely will be a prolonged crisis. And we saw this with the arrival of COVID, where not having adequate stocks of personal protective equipment increased the risk to health workers and the elderly and the vulnerable. But to have avoided those problems would have depended upon better anticipation upstream of what a coronavirus pandemic would look like. And the absence of such forethought is, I'm afraid, a regular conclusion of inquiries that are set up to examine the causes of crisis. I think anticipation is rather a good word to use here. Anticipating an event is conjuring up a vivid image in your mind of what it would actually be like. Next month, I know I will have my 76th birthday. It's in the diary. Anticipating it is much more than that factual knowledge. It's conjuring up images in my mind, for example, of the family party I'll have, and that helps remind me of some of the upstream preparations I need to take, such as checking the supplies of champagne in the cellar. Anticipating a major risk on the risk register is understanding viscerally what the situation would actually be like, what it would feel like, if it actually happened, not least to the reputations of those in charge at the time. One way of doing this uh, that I've used during my career, uh, I borrowed it shamelessly from one of the major oil companies, goes as follows. You have the risk register, we've all got these, um, long lists of possible disasters that might occur, difficulties, you arrange to have a discussion at the management board or the senior executive committee of the risk register, but you split it up into three parts. And the first part of the discussion is getting colleagues to talk about the major exogenous risks, the ones that are outside the control of the business or the department, such as a terrorist attack on the building next door, a supplier going bust, a hack leading to the loss of sensitive personal information of staff members and so on. And the key to that kind of discussion is tough questions about the state of insurance and hedging and contingency plans. And uh, when were the plans and procedures last exercised for real? The likelihood of the terrorist attack may be low, but we know in our hearts, even unlikely events do happen and you don't want them to happen on your watch to find to your horror that you're unprepared. In the second part of the discussion it's rather different. You get colleagues to consider the risks inherent in the kind of activity the business or departments engaged in. In financial institutions there will be attempts at fraud. In the prison service inmates will try to escape. In the security world 
staff will leave laptops and documents on trains. So the question is, how reliable are the internal systems of assurance of compliance with regulations and how are they actually tested out? But it's the third part of the agenda where you get really interesting and revealing discussions. And that's where you have to get colleagues to recognize the self-imposed risks, the initiatives that management in its wisdom decided to impose on the organization. It might be a decision to enter a new line of business or enter a new overseas market, a change of finance director, a new information management system, or a freeze on recruitment. Those sort of changes could sink the organization if they're badly handled. So the board or the management committee needs to probe. Did Remind me, did we have the very best team on the case? What resourcings? did we give the implementers? Is the regular reporting of progress uh, with the initiative really open and honest about the inevitable problems that arise with change? Or is there a culture that encourages honest identification of issues early enough and requests for help? Or the opposite, where uh, the executives try and keep the bad news to themselves in the faint hope that somehow they might manage to turn the situation around. And so it's only when crisis is almost upon us that you, the senior leadership, gets to know. Uh, if you, that sort of three-part discussion I've found brings even long-winded and unimaginative risk registers to life. Now, in the early stages of immediate response to a crisis, the priorities are usually simple, saving life and property. But the objectives to be secured during the later stages of a major crisis require a much deeper analysis because you've got all the indirect consequences as the situation unfolds, uh, the best leaders interpret these dynamic, ambiguous situations, um, and they take steps which themselves may create further problems. The very best leaders communicate simply to the organization or possibly wider, simply uh, to the stakeholders, what is to be done and why. And the best example recently that I've seen of that sense-giving leadership is that of President Zelensky following the Russian invasion. On the other hand, uh, populist leadership, if you've got the wrong ideas, can make matters worse. There was an interesting paper by three Cambridge economists recently, and they went out and gathered electoral information on credit card expenses, geolocalized mobile phone data, and so on, from about 60 million devices, phones in Brazil. And after the Brazilian president followed Trump and publicly dismissed the risks of COVID-19 and challenged medical recommendations, lo and behold, social distancing in pro-government localities declined and infections rose. And the higher the media penetration levels and number of active Twitter accounts, the more pronounced the effects were of the wrong kind of leadership. So, it's important that leaders uh, empower individuals and organizations with as close to truthful and accurate information as they can possibly get uh, so that individuals can make their own informed decisions towards a common uh, purpose. Um, I mentioned a moment ago the what I think is quite a useful distinction between the crises caused by sudden major shocks that suddenly burst on us with little or no warning, and the slow burn problems that foster, fester for years before they burst on us as full-blown crises. In some ways, sudden emergencies are easier. They're certainly easier to understand. They have to be tackled with what we have to hand at the time. And I think the UK has done a good job investing in procedures and capabilities for dealing with no notice events. 
our emergency services are very good. But an enduring lesson from my time in government is the need to keep people and processes tuned up through training and exercises. Even if you have the basis for a world-class system for managing emergencies, as we do, both people and capabilities can find themselves decidedly off the pace when the call comes unexpectedly. And if anyone doubts this, just uh, read the independent report into the suicide bombing attack on the Ariana Grande concert at the Manchester Arena and the additional suffering that was caused by the inadequate training and exercising of some of those who are actually in command of the emergency response. So to conclude, to conclude, my forthcoming book and this talk are really trying to get over an overall resilience message uh, that I think is key to surviving a crisis. Not every unexpected disruption in our lives needs to become a full-blown crisis, provided we've anticipated the possibility. And not every crisis needs to tip over into failure and disaster, provided and it's a big proviso that we have previously invested sufficiently in personal, in corporate and in national resilience. So that's my, my, that's my overall message to you all. So thank you for listening. Uh, very happy now to discuss and debate uh, all of these issues. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. We've got quite a few comments and questions, quite a few indeed. Uh, we won't be able to get through all of them. Um, I was also kind of interested because you, you, re you referenced uh, Facebook um, uh, starting in 2004. And actually, even that was preceded by something called Six Degrees, which arose, I believe, in 96. So uh, Zuckerberg was only sort of copying it. So you could really see these things uh, coming along. And we, we are still struggling uh, with, with social media. Well, let's get cracking. Um, William Domini's got a, a question. He's just sort of curious uh, about how do we deal with brewing crises in the international sphere, in all honesty. I mean, these things are happening. He's looking at two. One is Chinese interference with the Brahmaputra flow in Tibet, uh, and the other is the exploitation of the Nubian sandstone aquifer in Egypt or Libya to supply water to Chad. Re recharge of the aquifer may be possible from the Nile, uh, particularly if the uh, Jongali Canal is built to avoid water losses through evaporation. But if that goes wrong, lots of shooting. Uh, and then uh, we saw the audience's intense interest in China, which has come up a few times here. So when we're looking at things like that, which we can sort of see coming and burbling, is there really much we can do? Yeah, well, the first thing we can do is really get some good minds to work. Uh, there'll probably be outside government, um, uh, there'll be academics, there'll be business folk. And one of the powers that government does have is the convening power of getting people together. So the stage one is, is what I call situational awareness. What is, what's the stage of the planning for these sorts of uh, developments or the rate of melting of the glaciers and the, whatever it might be? Then are we really, have we got good reason to believe uh, the explanations we've got as to why the Chinese government is doing this or doing that. And then raising consciousness, you've got to then get it to international fora. And it may take years, but eventually you can build up uh, consensus that there are some things that should be supported, but they may have to be done in slightly different ways. And there are some things that are frankly dangerous. And that message has got to be delivered, doesn't mean it's always going to be taken. But yeah, I think, Michael, there are things you can do. Good. Um, it was good. John Deverell's got a number of comments here. Um, I'll read off to you, but he's also got some questions. Uh, he, he points out, of course, it wasn't just, uh, I want my life back, but 11 law lives were actually lost, literally, not just the, the snide comment um, that was made uh, by the chap. Uh, and on the doctors, he would also point out that as well as the pay, it was also a cap on the number of would-be doctors to be trained each year. So uh, in a sense, that uh, that also exacerbates things, particularly with regard to supply and demand. Um, the John was, uh, was talking about some good examples of crises being successfully managed and coming out stronger. Uh, the Elgin Field Gas League, Total, uh, Chairman Bishop, 
uh, good actions after British Midlands K Kegworth fatal crash. Um, and he, he says there's sort of three things, you know, one, what happened, two, what are we doing about it, and three, in due course, what are we doing to prevent a repeat? And so his uh, point to you is really, where is the value in preventing a repeat, and do we pay enough attention to that? Yeah, um, I'd add one other thing. I mean, there's, there's a great point, John. I'd also add studying near misses. Mm. You learn an awful lot by studying near misses, uh, and they don't tend to be surrounded by quite the the atmospherics that go with you know loss of life and death, and you can learn thing things from that. The point you make about junior doctors is actually absolutely on the point, because had we really paid attention to the declining real wages over a period of really quite a number of years, that ought then to have caused a rethink about the um, conditions of service, about the strain on individuals because there weren't enough junior doctors and the extent to which that was making the problem worse. So it's that kind of analysis. Uh, once you've spotted there is a slow burn crisis and you can start to uh, do something uh, uh, about it. But, you know, the point is well made, absolutely well made. Okay. Um, Clive Mullen is curious if you have any thoughts. What are the three biggest events we should be worried about and prepare for as individuals? Well, um, take your take your pick. Uh, depends where you are, which country you're in. Uh, it depends on your circumstances, and if you know, we have risk to the family, uh, and uh, I am very impressed uh, with the way in which the Scandinavian countries, uh, Norway and Sweden and Finland, have taken resilience as a national goal. And they are much better prepared. Now, sometimes the you know, climate is, tends to be a bit uh, adverse in northern Norway, so they're used to that. But we are reaching a point in this country where we are going to have to prepare ourselves for much more adverse weather swings, whether it's drought or whether it's floods, and prepare ourselves and prepare families to be much more uh, able to cope with some of those uh, st stresses and strains. Now, you could say that's a long-term problem, uh, we'll survive next year, we'll survive the year after, and that tends to be the response at a political level because it's well, you know, well outside the planning horizon for most uh, governments. But if we don't start doing that, um, and an, another example would be microplastics mm. in courses, which mm. we've let that just creep up on us, or straightforward uh, nitrate to pollution of the River Wye, where again, it's crept up and up. Uh, and it's never quite the right moment you know, to make life very difficult for the farmers by saying, well, no, you can't do that anymore. But unless somebody at some point does that, the problem is just going to get worse. And then yeah. it becomes a hazard to human health. Yeah, I was at a water conservators debate. Uh, yes, your worshipful company, water conservators at Baker's Hall, and they had five people from the water industry and Heian Wai featured uh, quite prominently. Uh, and there, that was an interesting example where most of the audience concluded that the difficulty is we weren't managing on a catchment basis. And further, we weren't managing the planning permissions and we weren't managing the agriculture alongside the water base. And these were separate. So everybody is going on to tax water companies to clean up the river, even though really it should have been taxing the polluters, uh, but, but they were the easy target. Uh, and this type of joined up thinking is very hard. Speaking of Hey on Why, do you want to make a quick announcement about that? Yes, I'm uh, going to be speaking on this subject uh, at the How the Light Gets In uh, uh, festival, which takes place at coincidentally with the Hey on Why uh, festival coming up at the end of May. So I'll be speaking uh, twice at the uh, uh, In Hay on the, the 29th of, the, of May. So I see some of you there. Now, David and I also wanted to uh, do another poll. And while that poll's flashing and you're answering it, I'll let you go for it, folks. Uh, David, we've got a question from Dean Rose. Now, 
Uh, he says, does Sir David have any particular insights or solutions to build resilience in global supply chains, particularly with the current rush for a just transition and securing what is needed for clean energy? And just a small advertisement from FS Club. Uh, we're having a breakfast on the 18th of April for those who are interested in that uh, whole issue of supply chain security. But uh, David, any insights on building resilience in global supply chains? When you look at it from a, a sort of analytical point of view, the big step that's needed is buffering, and that costs. So you need greater stocks. Um, you need to be in a position where the temporary ups and downs uh, in a supply chain can be uh, smoothed out. And because of the wonderful way that information technology now allows uh, the most precise calculation of the minimum possible stock, which will enable your factory to keep going. Frankly, there is very little resilience in the system. Um, I get more skeptical when I read about uh, onshoring and is the answer to global supply chains not to have them. So let's do all our manufacturing. You then begin to lose all the benefits of trade uh, and uh, you're going to end up with a much more expensive uh, product. So, you know, there's a there's kind of balance to be to be made in that. But the first, first thing is to identify where the real vulnerabilities are. Uh, Ukraine provides that wonderful example of the electrical harnesses for modern motor cars, which Ukraine specialized in. And they're very complex to make. It's what tied together all the semiconductors that are uh, 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 print, printed circuits that a modern car has. And it's suddenly, they're not available. So you have all the big automotive companies having to go on to short time working because they haven't got the harnesses. Now that's, would it have been worth their while um, having readily um, yeah, uh, range, standby manufacturing arrangements, uh, uh, intellectual property arrangements, which would enable in an interruption of supply to shorten the time to produce alternatives? That's the kind of thinking that uh, would help. Now, David, we got to the results of the poll there. It's interesting, uh, really nearly 80% of the audience uh, feel that they, uh, they could probably handle a hostile cyber attack, um, which is intriguing. But uh, just moving on, uh, we're gonna have to be very swift on this one, but uh, Peter Warren is curious, given the tremendous speed of development of AI and the fragility of world communications infrastructure, should cyber security attacks be prescribed? Uh, the potential to generate a disaster unwittingly is now huge. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, these are criminal acts, uh, find the criminals. The criminals are sheltering in jurisdictions that will never extradite them. Um, the most of the emphasis has to go on us as the owners of information to keep it secure and available. And that's going to cost us a little more than ideally we would like to spend. But now the, the, the downside cost of getting hit badly. And I think the not Petra uh, mm. billion is a lot of money for record and all the big companies uh, to have to fork out this kind of money. Um, mm. And there will be more because people will discover other vulnerabilities. The solar winds attack in the US uh, using supply chains, you know, all of these things. So just, you know, be ready. Um, and if you've got Crown Jewel, I've never understood why organizations and companies that have really, really valuable information still have it on the network, accessible to anybody who's on the network. Yeah. I mean, it's not so expensive to compartment it, to encipher it, to monitor who is accessing it. And if it's somebody from the other side of the world, from the branch on the other side of the world in the middle of the night, then an alarm bell has to ring to say something's going wrong. We've got time for just two quick uh, comment and then a, I think quite a subtle question. Uh, Derek Marshall is wondering, you know, given current resilience involves government making spending choices about which potential crises to take most seriously, 
is our government actually set up to take these kind of decisions? I think that's a, you know, or, or is it really the Daily Mail who makes them? Uh, but Richard Harvey, is, he says, I work in my spare time as a category one responder for the emergency services. I've noticed that colleagues with good foresight, of uh, good forethought, have vivid imagination. They are creative, but creative people are not drawn to the emergency services because emergency response is nowhere little room for freestyle operators. Is there some kind of society of war gamers or crisis strategists? How do we get such people into modern organizations, especially as they are often pilloried as Jeremiah's? Yeah, uh, to take the second one first, that one of the things that comes out here is exercising, uh, which needn't necessarily be very expensive. It can be done around a table, tabletop exercising. I ran about eight of those. Uh, in 2012, just before the Olympics, to test out all the possible ways in which something disastrous could happen. Whether it was too hot, whether it was too cold, cyber attacks, industrial accidents, you name it. But it, that's where the imagination comes in. Um, but uh, you don't want to be, given the horrific circumstances that people have to be in, to be yeah. effective response to responders, um, I can understand the, the the point of the question. The point of the question. I mean, the the first question was remind me, Michael. I'll just answer it. Very uh, it was very much about the the creativity of people and how they don't fit into the emergency uh, type organizations because they are almost by definition like rule breakers. Yeah, um, in government. We don't, at the moment, really have what we need to have to grip this on a all of society basis. And there are other countries, I've mentioned the Scandinavians, who are better set up. But the good news is that those trusts having abolished the effort in the centre, it's now been recreated by uh, the Prime Minister and new people have been brought in. So I'm moderately optimistic that the, uh, these difficult questions about where do you spend the money on resilience will actually get made. And the good thing about uh, having a more resilient uh, national uh, critical infrastructure is it's multi-purpose. So it doesn't matter whether it's a terrorist attack or a cyber attack or some natural disaster. What you want is the electricity supply to that particular region to be back on as quickly as possible. So investing in the standby capacity and so on fulfilled. Yep. And probably that's where we'll put most of the money as a nation, I think, in things that have multi-purpose. Well, um, I'm sad that we come to the end of time. Uh, John Deverell would like to explore things like, you know, how, if Scandinavian countries also have similarly short election cycles, yet they seem to pull it off at why. Uh, Hugh Purser's interest in analyzing risk registers and what we might learn from Aikido in terms of peripheral awareness. Uh, and Derek Marshall is really looking at, uh, again, more of the government stuff. There's lots to go on and we could go on, but I'm going to have to draw it to a close. And I might do so with... Uh, uh, two points, really. I, I think um, you, you made an, uh, an excellent point about what to do. Uh, discuss the exogenous risks, uh, discuss the obvious uh, threats to sector, and then look at what decisions we're making that are exposing us. And I think that's very good advice because board discussions in this space uh, can be almost meaningless. Um, you know, well, it's not going to happen to us, or if it happens to us, what can we do? Uh, oh, you've got to, yeah, or boring. So that that that's excellent advice. I think the second thing is. Um, you know, having been there, you, you make a point in, in your new book, really, that there's no such thing as crisis management. The crisis will manage you. It's how you respond to it uh, that's there. And and yet, I, I I myself would argue, not against that, that, that there's a, it's almost a different type of management style, which is managing by crisis. I did a study in 1992, 30 years ago, 31 years ago, uh, on vision into action. And what we learned was that good leaders actually generated crises. We're about to lose all of our market share to a competitor. We have to do something, even though they might not have been that dangerous, but it made the organization galvanize. And I think sometimes in our culture, uh, we seem to think that crisis is a bad way to manage. It's actually not necessarily a bad way to manage because all organizations are teetering like all life forms. On, on the edge of, uh, of extinction. And it's not a bad thing to think about that. And you spoke about the paradox of warning, you know, and then this is the boy who cried wolf pit. So the chief executive who constantly says, we're about to die, we're about to die. 
is actually in many ways trying to remind an organization not to be complacent. Uh, and uh, we, we get back to you know the, the old paranoia management as well. It's been really fascinating, really good to have you folks. Uh, several things, uh, uh, Dave, David at Hay on Why, but more importantly, buy the book. It's a good book, it's a good read, and it makes a good present if you very careful when you're reading it not to break the back. Um, so <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I have three rounds of thanks, if I may. Uh, firstly, to our sponsors. Secondly, to the audience, extraordinarily vibrant. Yes, uh, we didn't get to all the questions, but they will all get to David uh, for you. And uh, please do look at the website to see the events that are forthcoming. Um, but I will say that uh, bright and early tomorrow morning, we will be launching Global Financial Index 33. Uh, who would have thought it would run that long? But it is it is it has been running since 2005 and some interesting results there. Uh, but my most sincere thanks, David, have to go to you. Uh, you've appeared a number of times with us and we genuinely appreciate it. They're always erudite and informative and you always leave me thinking. And I know all of the members of the audience. So our, our warmest thanks to you for appearing today. Thanks very much, Michael, and thanks for the opportunity.